This is the Sustainability Speaker Series. And we first want to thank um, Nancy Eklund and the Homer Hayward Family Foundation. They're the ones that provide funding for this series. So, big thank to our sponsors. And uh, today we have Matthew Iglesias. He is co founder of Vox, where he is a senior correspondent and host of the Weeds podcast, both of which I highly recommend. One is to bookmark Vox and read your news at Vox. And, then to subscribe to the Weeds podcast, which is one of my favorites, and actually what prompted me to invite Matthew out here for this talk. And so you might ask yourself, what is reactionary uh, politics as a cause of economic decline have to do with sustainability? And so I'm going to set the stage here. So a lot of what we in the environmental and progressive sustainability community are angling for whether it's a Green New Deal, a Blue New Deal, a kind of massive response to climate change, is going to be a big economic transition, a big dislocation of a lot of industries, a lot of creation of new industries, and it's going to include a lot of disruption that's going to be a lot of social upheaval. And so we in the environmental progressive community probably don't pay enough attention to that, right? That we're going to really have to pay attention to how people are going to transition into new jobs and job retraining and just geographic movement. And so this is an important topic. I was listening to uh, a Weeds podcast at the beginning of the year and Matthew was talking about, they were talking about the, the classic kind of Trump phenomenon of economic decline leading to the rise of Trumpism. And that's the narrative you hear in the media a lot. And Matthew pointed out, he said, I actually have a novel theory that the direction of causation works the other way. That it's actually reactionary conservative politics that is leading to economic decline. And I said, wow, that's interesting. I had never thought about that. And I said, that's probably very important for us to think about because if we're really pushing a progressive agenda of a Green New Deal, we might need to take these cultural factors into account in crafting a strategy for kind of social cohesion in the aftermath and the transition to this new kind of economy. And so I emailed Matthew and he was generous enough to come out and expound on his theory. And so let's give him a warm honorary welcome. I'm really excited to be here. I just want to open with two, you know, uh, set expectations low. Um, I normally do talks based on stuff that I have worked on a lot and covered and published for years. Uh, this, uh, I got an email uh, to ask me to talk about an offhand remark on a podcast, so I thought that would be a good opportunity to try to develop these ideas further. Uh, but you guys are some of the first audience that I have shot this to, so maybe a little half-assed, uh, but I'm really interested to hear feedback and thoughts. I should also say my, my PowerPoint work is a little bit amateurish. I'm trying to get better, but there's no fancy animations or, or anything cool, mostly just uh, bullet points and the occasional dumb picture. Um, but so I, I think we're all familiar with the idea that there are voters in areas that have been left behind by economic growth, that uh, white working class men in particular have suffered from a poor economic situation and that this is causing them to embrace a kind of new reactionary populism. Uh, my hypothesis that I want to explore is that this is largely backwards, that the ecological association between populism and economic decline is real, but that the direction of causation is the other way, that we are seeing that a psychological resistance to change and clinging to traditional gender norms, a preference for homogeneity, is making it harder to adapt to the sort of economic needs of today. Um, so the conventional view, which I think uh, most people who follow American politics, even European politics will know, says that populist right policies are in some sense a consequence of bad economic decisions, um, and that the constituency for populist right policies has been left behind by globalization, by neoliberalism, by some aspect of modernity, and that therefore, uh, from a left perspective, the key to winning is through better economic uh, policy making, which will improve conditions and make people see the benefits of cosmopolitanism or whatever it is uh, we like to do in California. Um, 
My hypothesis is that this is backwards, uh, that reactionary cultural attitudes cause economic stagnation, that the constituency for sort of populist right reaction, uh, they just hold these values dearly. And like many people with all kinds of values, they are willing to bear economic costs in order to have their preferences uh, preserved. Uh, you know, liberal people will be familiar with the idea that sometimes it's nice to have wilderness rather than a giant mine, right? It might be economically costly, but you might value that anyway. Uh, you might value homogeneity in your community, even if immigrants would be more economically beneficial. Um, and so therefore, the key to unleashing prosperity is to defeat the populist threat. Uh, it's, it's backwards. You need to uh, fix problems by overcoming the political impediments. Um, to be clear, some stuff that I agree with. Um, having popular economic policy ideas is a good political strategy. Regardless, right? Particularly, there are cross-pressure voters, uh, which is to say, people who might agree with one faction on some stuff and another on other things. It's good to emphasize points of agreement and not try to win. It's also clearly true that a strong economic conditions help incumbents win. So, like in a narrow sense, if we had had a huge economic boom in the year 2016, uh, that would have made it harder for Donald Trump to win the election, just because. Obama would have looked awesome. Uh, and it's also true that policymaking elites um, have made mistakes in economic policy. It's not, this is not intended as a blanket defense of everything that's ever happened in the 21st century. Um, but the conventional view of this makes some very strong claims when we have up here, right? They are saying not just that like economic debates matter in politics, but that very specifically, uh, Mark Lilla in particular, right? That people suffer economically and then they seek out scapegoats. They, they become racists because of their economic problems. Uh, Naomi Klein says that, that neoliberalism has caused Donald Trump. Um, and that's what I think is not true. It's not really supported by the facts. Um, so, you know, the way I think about this is, is you imagine a test for this. You imagine a place that resembles Trump country in its demographic terms, right? Uh, a very white, very rural place, very working class kind of place. But suppose this place is doing really well economically, right? That, that globalization, neoliberalism, whatever, it, it's not failing people there. Um, so what would happen, right? So welcome to North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota is a place that fits those conditions. Uh, North Dakota is uh, it's very white, it's incredibly rural, um, it's, it's one of the whitest states. Its largest metro area is smaller than tiny towns nobody ever goes to or has heard of. Um, it's got a below average educational attainment. So this is like classic Trump country, right? White, working class, rural state. Uh, but in North Dakota, the economy is doing really well, right? It's not typical of Trump country in that regard. Uh, North Dakota just recently was poorer than the U.S. average, uh, but it has come to be richer than the U.S. average. Uh, quite rapid turnaround there, uh, so things are going well there. Uh, you ask why? Um, it is because of oil. Uh, this is some lovely uh, river on fire because they are mining so much oil out of there. Um, if you look at it, they've just had a staggering increase in oil and natural gas production in the uh, Bakken shale there. I am not someone who is super knowledgeable about how exactly the shale fracking boom came about, uh, but it has come about. It has unleashed incredible amounts of prosperity in North Dakota, whatever the sort of environmental and social costs of that. Uh, so you would say, whatever has been happening in America, the economy has not been failing the white working class in North Dakota. And you can drill down, I looked up some boring statistics, and, and you can see uh, fast food workers there make 20% more than the national average. Uh, a lot of stuff like that, tight labor market, things are, things are going well. Um, so what happened politically? Um, according to Naomi Klein, uh, Donald Trump speaks to people who are in pain. North Dakota is not experiencing pain. So North Dakota should be rejecting Donald Trump, right? Saying, no, things are good, uh, we, we love elites, uh, life is good here. Um, absent economic disenfranchisement, according to Mark Lilla, voters should be rejecting racism. They should be saying, well, we don't need any scapegoats for our problems because we don't have any problems. Uh, the actual political consequences are 63% uh, vote for Donald Trump. Um, North Dakota has always been a conservative state, but as you can see here, it is getting more conservative 
during this time. Not atypical of overwhelmingly white rural areas. Trump did better in all kinds of places like that. Uh, but the point is, even in a place that is doing really well economically, his appeal remains completely intact. Um, so I was actually inspired in this by a parallel finding on marriage that Melissa Kearney and her co-author did. They were looking, investigating the hypothesis which has been widely mooted that uh, declining economic conditions are why uh, working class marriage rates have declined. So she looked at fracking boom areas and said, okay, um, so male earnings go up, there's more marriageable men here, do uh, people get married more there? And she found they don't. Um, people do have more children in fracking boom areas because they have more money and children, I don't know if anybody here has kids, um, children are very expensive. Uh, and so if you have more money, you might have more children. Uh, but marriage rates do not go up. There is an autonomous operating cultural milieu that is not driven by the underlying economics. I have no views on marriage, but this is what inspired me to kind of look more broadly at this question. Um, so boring individual level math, uh, we have uh, social scientists who can do better math than I do, and they try to do elaborate statistical correlations. They show that uh, views about race and gender are very strong correlates of supporting Donald Trump. Levels of satisfaction with the economy are only weak correlates. Um, you know, this is what all the sort of politics nerds know, um, and I'm really just taking a big picture view of the same thing. So one question is like, why do we argue about this topic at all? Uh, why does it keep coming up on podcasts and in takes? Uh, one big reason I think is wishful thinking from leftists. Uh, people who have a strongly held view that there should be sweeping changes in economic policy, good for them. Uh, they would like to believe that that is also the key to uh, winning elections. Maybe not true. Uh, politeness from moderates. It is considered very rude to say that a big reason that everybody votes for the racist candidate is that they themselves are racists. Uh, if you can come up with some elaborate circumlocution, that sounds nicer. And, and I mean, I agree. It, it's nice to say nice things about people. Uh, but there's also a real observation here, which is that Trump does better on average in places that are struggling economically. That is not a mistake. Um, here we've got some charts here. Uh, small towns, rural counties have had very weak job growth recently. Um, overall, economy has not been great, but it's held up much better in big cities, big metro areas. Um, this is a, a map. It's a kind of cool thing. They took uh, every county uh, that Hillary won versus Trump won, and they scaled it to the size of the economy. Uh, so we know, right, if you look at land area, Trump won the vast majority of sort of the terrain of the United States. Population-wise, it's about even. In terms of economic output, it is really, really heavily tilted uh, toward Hillary counties. Um, you know, and that tells us something. So it's true that reactionary areas have weaker economies on average, but we also know that good economic luck as in North Dakota, doesn't weaken reactionary politics. And we know that on an individual level, economic problems only weakly correlate with, uh, with reactionary politics. That, you know, a lot of Trump voters, they, uh, they might own car dealerships uh, or they're dentists. You know, they're doing fine, even if they're in poor working class areas. Um, so I, I think what we're seeing here is like two paths to prosperity in the modern world. Right. One is the galaxy brain guy. He is thinking up ideas from his mind, founding companies that do things, has patents, innovates. Uh, the other is you dig some crap up from the ground and sell it to other people. Um, and these both work, um, miraculously or not. Uh, but there's different approaches to how you get them, right? And the mind-based approaches to prosperity, it pays off to invest in education, uh, both because uh, your own citizens become more educated, but also because universities, research institutes act as sort of uh, magnetic attractors for skilled people. Urban agglomeration externalities, this is a complicated word uh, for the fact that innovation industries do better in cities uh, where you have multiple firms uh, sort of working in the same field, right? So we know uh, people who want to found tech companies tend to go to the Bay Area because they might want to grow really rapidly and hire lots of engineers. So they need to be located in a place where a lot of engineers live. 
and aspiring engineers who want to go to a place where there are a lot of startups and a lot of tech companies. So more and more people kind of pile into the San Jose, San Francisco area. They also open up offices in New York, you know, other places where skilled workers kind of cluster together. Pleasant lifestyle amenities also helps. Uh, Monterey is, uh, it's not so nice today in this humidity, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a nice town, right? Uh, people people want to come here. Um, which is good. You're trying to attract skilled workers. You'd like to have, you know, good weather, beaches, like nice restaurants. People, people with mobility want to be in nice places. Um, digging stuff out of the ground is very different. Um, it is compatible with anti-intellectual attitudes and with traditional gender norms. Uh, manly men working on rigs. Uh, you need skills uh, to do this stuff. I mean, we shouldn't caricature it, but you don't need super high levels of education, particularly liberal artsy kind of stuff doesn't pay off in these fields. Um, the bad news is it only works if there happens to be something valuable on the ground. You can't just have a fracking boom because you happen to want to. Uh, there has to be the shale and the oil there. It also often creates unpleasant living conditions. Uh, if you, I was talking the other day, um, it was a couple months ago, uh, to the mayor of Midland, Texas. And you know he was talking about how they need more workers in Midland, uh, but they struggle sometimes to attract them, because Midland is, um, I mean, he wouldn't put it this way, but like it's a kind of shitty place to live. Uh, there's not a lot going on. Uh, they, there's not a lot of women living there. It's not a good places for people to date. My brother-in-law worked there for like a year. He quit. Um, these extraction economies, they're just like, they're not that great, even if there's good money. Um, so in terms of economic development, you know, one thing that we see, this is uh, Lyman Stone, who's one of my favorite conservative writers. He's a demographics expert. He's uh, born and raised in Kentucky. He, he's done really careful sort of research on, on this kind of stuff. And he found that like one of the places that's doing the best in eastern Kentucky is this little town, Pikeville. Um, and the reason Pikeville is doing well is that Kentucky expanded the college there, right? And so here you have, in a general collapsing coal economy, one sort of thriving city because there was an investment made in education there. Um, but what in practice do right-wing politicians do? Um, so Alaska is a traditional natural resource extraction economy. Uh, they have started to run out of oil there, so their revenue is on its way down need to decide what to do. And what they're deciding to do is uh, wreck their higher education system. Uh, so in effect, they're going to have less oil in the future, but also <laughs> less things that aren't oil. Um, you see this in West Virginia, too. They are disinvesting in higher education, even though really one of the only validated things we know to sort of create prosperity in small town areas is to turn them into college towns. Uh, all across the board, conservative governments are backing out of that. Um, here we have uh, 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 Kentucky, Matt Bevin, the very state where Pikeville is. It's it's noble story there. But he's saying not only that he's cutting, he's not saying like, uh, I hate that I had to make this decision, but it was the only thing to do. He's saying it's actually good. Uh, because his budget cuts will force them to cut programs that don't add value, right? Um, that's a little bit nutty, in my opinion, uh, but it apparently makes a lot of sense to voters in Kentucky. Um, and, and you can see that there's an anti-intellectual approach to politics on the right that impedes things that would help. Uh, these are tweets from Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri. Um, and so what happened here is that there was an idea to move the U.S. Department of Agriculture's uh, Economic Research Service out of Washington, D.C. into the state of Missouri. Um, so I think that's like a kind of plausible idea, right? There's no real need for those people to be right in D.C. It's not a super political agency. Uh, it would be good for Missouri to have more skilled workers in it, right? There's a lot of, you know, PhD economists, other good researchers there. There is more farming in Missouri than there is in Washington, D.C. And the cost of living in Missouri is much lower than in Washington. So in principle, this should be a win-win, right? It helps the economy in Missouri. It saves some money for the government. It lets the uh, people in this agency get bigger houses, uh, you know, send their kids to good schools. But obviously, if you tell everyone, 
hey, you got three months to pack up your bags and move to Kansas City. Like, that's a problem for adults with families and, and things there. And that's in effect what the Trump administration did, right? Instead of putting this together in a thoughtful way, they told everyone to wrap up their lives within six months or quit. And so what wound up happening is that two-thirds of the agency staff said, no, I can't move, I'm, I'm quitting, right? So that's bad for Missouri, objectively, right? Missouri wants the people to move. Instead, they quit. And Hawley, instead of yelling at the Trump administration for fucking this up and screwing over Missouri, he's doing this kind of culture war grandstanding where he's saying, oh, these snobs, they said they couldn't come to Missouri. Uh, when, you know, like, it's just common sense. Like, nobody wants to just move with no notice to a place they never heard of. They, they need time, they need preparation. But Hawley is more interested in the sort of politics of posturing against smug liberal elitists, um, even though he himself says, like, Missouri voted for real Donald Trump by almost 20 points, right? He doesn't need to squeeze out six extra votes. What he needs to do is actually help the economy of Missouri, but he's not doing that. Um, and this stuff isn't just about money, right? Uh, Marco Rubio has this shtick for years where he was talking about how there's too many philosophy majors in America. And I, I take it personally because I, I was a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> Philosophy is a great thing to study. You know, it helps you make logical arguments. It helps you read texts critically. Um, these are useful skills in the workplace, jobs. You have lots of memos, things like that. I learned symbolic algebra. Um, universities are good, right? But he gets juice out of this idea that, like, oh, philosophy, they're wasting their time. Um, but you go any place that has, like, a great university philosophy department, they're glad to have it. But it's not how he sees it. Um, this is Donald Trump talking to a uh, some kind of fracking conference in Pennsylvania. And, and he's indicating that it's bad to get people to have new skills and new industries, right? He says, you don't want to learn how to make a computer with tiny things. You have big hands. Um, you want to make steel and big coal. And, he, and it's weird, but he uses this line all the time. He'll tell these stories. And he always emphasizes it's big guys with their big hands. And they want to work with coal and steel. They don't want to learn how to make computer chips. Um, and the politics of this evidently work, right? And Trump, Trump kills it at these rallies, and people love it, and he, he's gotten good votes in these areas. Uh, but it's the most economically suicidal thing you can imagine to tell a group of people that it is actively bad for their communities to develop new industries, that they should only do the old industries that they've got. Like, nobody would think that. And there's also obviously a, a gendered element to this. He keeps emphasizing something about the size of the hands, right? Like, uh, it, would be, uh, it would be unmanly to have computer chip manufacturing. Uh, the only thing that's good enough is steel. Um, and traditional gender norms <coughs> themselves are sort of a problem. This is from a, a New York Times. Uh, they did a series of articles about this. Um, most of the occupations that are projected to have the most growth in the future are predominantly female. Uh, this wind turbine thing is a, an important exception. But, you know, in the modern era of trade, of robots, blah, 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 uh, the work that remains to be done is a lot of interpersonal services, uh, a lot of healthcare, but also other things. These have traditionally been done by women, uh, but if there's an incredible amount of job growth in these fields, it's natural that men should get into them too, uh, but oftentimes they don't want to. Um, this was a, a follow-up, it's a sort of sociological study. It's showing that in working class communities, it's not just that men are resistant to taking on traditionally female occupations, but the women in those communities also are hostile to that idea. Um, and yet, you know, nursing is a good, uh, it's a good job. Um, you need to get some skills to do it, but um, there is a lot of work for nurses pretty much every place in America, but if people are psychologically resistant to taking that on because they want to work in a steel mill, that's a, that's a problem. 
Uh, and then there's aversion to immigration, uh, which is obviously a big political topic and, and a real issue here. So this was a feel-good story from September 2nd of 2016. Uh, this was about the town of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, which had been really hard hit in previous years by the decline of the, uh, the coal mining industry there. This is about how Dominican immigrants who had sort of uh, hopscotched over from Greater New York, had revitalized the town, there were all these Dominican stores downtown, the tax base had stabilized, good things were happening in Hazleton. Um, this was a more pessimistic story from a month later that Benny Applebaum did. Uh, he quotes Louis Bischlein, he says, I don't care for this town no more because of the Hispanics. Um, and so he's really very clear here that uh, he is not saying that because of economic problems, he has displaced anxiety onto Hispanics. Uh, he's 70, he's retired, he's got his social security, he's doing fine. He just doesn't like it that there are Dominican people living in his town now. Um, and so the punchline to this is Luzerne County uh, goes for Donald Trump. Uh, it's the first time since Richard Nixon that this particular county had gone for Trump. So, you know, you have the optimistic story, you have the pessimistic story, uh, and they're both true. Right? Immigration, it saved Hazleton, and the people who live there, they don't like it. Uh, and so, you know, that's a, that's a problem, because immigrants are the best hope that a lot of these places have for a turnaround. But if people don't want to live near immigrants, then, you know, they don't want to. Um, one thing to note, right, is that everything I'm talking about, it's not that related to what have over the course of, you know, 50 years been the main part of this, partisan themes in American politics, right? It's not about taxes and the welfare state. I'm, I'm not saying that uh, small government is bad. It's not about abortion and guns. It, it's not really about regulation of free markets either. These sort of old-fashioned left-right debates we've been having forever, um, I don't want to say they're irrelevant to economics. They're just not relevant to this particular conversation. Uh, but it has really deep links to a lot of the emerging issues in politics that people care about now. Uh, immigration, very, very obviously, but I think also climate change uh, to the point of this talk series because there's a kind of special relationship between natural resource extraction work and a kind of gendered, backward-looking uh, masculinity. Um, because fossil fuel extraction is the exception to the rule here. That is a development strategy that works and is compatible with this kind of traditionalist mindset. So people are going to be very, I mean, everyone is always reluctant to give up things that are economically beneficial to their community, but they're going to be especially reluctant to give up things that uniquely align with their identity and their preferences. If you tell them, you know, we can fix your town some other way. We can have a university uh, and a lot of grad students and some Dominicans. Uh, they're like, you know, I don't, I don't want that, right? Um, let's blast the sand into some shale. Uh, so, solutions. At the end of presentations, we were supposed to have solutions. Um, I don't know. <laughs> it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit of a tricky problem. I'm still working on the talk. Um, but one thing I would say, right, it's important to be clear about what you're trying to solve, right? If the question is, how do we help a struggling community? How do we help uh, Hazeltons, right? I think it requires mostly ideas that the local populations in these places are fairly hostile to. That you need to repopulate these communities with farm-born people, you need to make investments in higher education, and you need, I mean, it's the most boring DC thing, but it's true. You need people to get skills for new industries. They need to learn to make tiny hand computer chips uh, rather than steel. Um, winning more votes, though, you, you don't win votes by telling people stuff they don't want to hear. Uh, you win more votes by just doing politics, right? Um, something I think about all the time is, you know, back in 2008, uh, I thought that uh, uh, LGBT marriage equality was a good idea. Uh, everyone I knew thought it was a good idea. And nobody I knew had a problem with the fact that Barack Obama was pretending to think it was a bad idea. Because we understood, like, the public opinion wasn't there, right? You just had to pander to the electorate to win hope to change people's minds. Um, these days, I feel like that's fallen out of style. Uh, but politics is a, is a cynical business, and like sometimes you just gotta give the people what they want, even if what they want is done wrong. Um, <laughs> then another question, right, is homogenous rural areas 
have massive voting representation in the United States Senate. And this is getting worse as politics corresponds more with the urban world divide. And progressive people probably need to think more creatively about this than conventional politics. Uh, you gotta find some, some donors, somebody that's gotta like move a bunch of people to Billings uh, and to Anchorage and uh, all these other kinds of places. We need to actually address the population imbalance probably like way outside the scope of what people are, are used to thinking about because there isn't really a fix uh, narrowly politically. So that's not good, that's why I had the dots as my solutions. Um, but the, the key distinction here, right, is that um, you know you get a policy ideas that are designed to win votes of people who only agree with you about some stuff. Uh, so that's great, right? Like that's politics, that's electioneering. You gotta give the people what they want. Um, but then there's the idea of policy that's designed to shift the underlying source of the disagreement. And that's what I think is wrong, right? The, the, the moral of this is if you just sort of have a more generous welfare state, uh, and so people are less poor, uh, that's good on its own terms. But you shouldn't expect it to turn people into good cosmopolitans or environmentalists necessarily. Um, you can maybe win votes if what you've got on the table is popular, uh, but just like money down from the heavens doesn't change people's cultural attitudes. Uh, and so if you're doing cynical politics, you need to just be cynical about it. You know, try to try to get the votes, try to win the elections. Uh, don't aim for this kind of utopian, you know, double coincidence where fixing people's real problems will also make them love you. Uh, it's just the fact that people have different preferences around these things. Uh, so what I think is one key implication of this is that progressive-minded people who live in progressive states should worry more about our own problems. Uh, we have an incredible housing affordability crisis in most of the liberal coastal states. Certainly you do in California, uh, we do in my home state of New York. Uh, this is something that uh, we need to address and show that our model is functional and sustainable and that we know what we're doing and sort of prove to the rest of the country and the world that we're not uh, idiots. Um, basic services, right? I mean, I was in San Francisco a couple weeks ago and everybody was asking me, oh, are you gonna have electricity? And you know, I was. Uh, then I came here and I was like, are you gonna have electricity? Um, that's, that's embarrassing, right? For like the technological innovation hub of the world, we're telling people we're gonna give you like a Green New Deal and we can't keep electricity on, right? Like that's, that's not great. And this is stuff that we are empowered to fix, right? This kind of nexus of cultural politics, uh, disproportionate electoral weighting, economic problems, it doesn't stop the liberal areas of the country from trying to govern ourselves correctly. Uh, when I talk to my, my in-laws who are kind of um, uh, politically moderate people, traditionally Republicans that, that turned away from Trump. Uh, but all they hear about New York all the time is like the subway doesn't work. Um, that doesn't make it sound great to them. That, like you wanna, you wanna put the New Yorkers in charge of things. Uh, so you know, we gotta try to mind our own business because it's going to be harder than I think people would like to think to sort of turn the rest of the country around. And that is what I have. Good questions, I think. Yeah, raise your okay. hand and we'll take a couple got some good questions. Um, so I disagree with you about North Dakota. Dr. Taylor. All right. Uh, today's newspaper, the median home price in Monterey County is $660,000. Yeah. I'll support your point there. <laughs> um, my question, however, is about um, we, we tend, at the national level, we tend to view um, politics as this war. Uh, mm -hmm. between the sides. A vastly underreported uh, feature of American life today is the extent to which policy making, particularly at the state and local level, is all about participation, engagement, uh, bringing people together to find solutions, mm -hmm. not imposing solutions on people, but educating them so that they come up with their own ideas about what the solutions are. And this is this is now a major feature of rural in mm -hmm. the United States. 
Um, it, it's it's the way in which it's the normal course of business now in state and local government. I had no I no place it whatsoever in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would like to ask in your in in your um, model, uh, what role does the idea of um, challenging people to come up with their own solutions and helping them do so play in terms of the political dynamic that you've outlined? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, you know, looking at big cities has made me very skeptical of community participation. Um, I think that community participation has turned out to be a huge contributor to the housing crisis problems that we're talking about. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not to say that it's bad for people to have input, right? But the question always becomes, like, whose community and, and what representation, and you often get, I mean, I see in my neighborhood, you know, these very sort of uh, unrepresentative groups, you know, manifest themselves as the community. They um, emphasize idiosyncratic, basically just they want parking spaces, and that trumps all other, you know, conceivable considerations. Uh, so I don't know, right? And I, it has not been my, at least, observation that rural economic development plans being done by state governments in America have had a lot of success. Um, so I think that whatever is happening is not working that well. I know you and I were talking uh, before this about, about Maine and about the idea of a North Maine Woods uh, National Park, right? Which I think is a very much an example of the dynamic that we are talking about here. I mean, I think it is very clear that taking a dead logging community and turning it into a national park that people would come visit uh, would be really good for an area of the country that currently is just depopulating. It's cold, it's remote, uh, nobody lives there. Um, there's not as much demand for timber. Uh, there's been automation of those jobs anyway. Uh, but when you talk to people who live there, they are really dug in on the idea of a thriving natural resource extraction economy. and. Um, I, I don't know exactly what to say about it, other than that I think they're mistaken. Just look to the uh, Eureka Humboldt and the San Jacinto County area, what happened to the Delaware, the National the Redwood National Park, mm -hmm. in the middle of the Redwood, going down to the Redwoods, um, and the logging industry is still as busy now as it's ever been. Up there, just only two mills, three mills, is there thirty or forty? Uh -huh. um, and look at the economy; it's been going on since what the seventies. Uh -huh. So we've had that change happen. Right, right. And you know, it's just, I mean, I don't know, you know, but like people, people sort of want what they want. Uh, and often what they want is not change, right? Uh, but it's not healthy to avoid changes. And it would be, it would be nice to think, I, I hope that you could create structures where people talk through these things and they come to see uh, that, um, Refugee communities uh, have been good for Lewiston, that a national park would be good for Millinocket, uh, but I have not seen that really happening in people's, in people's minds. It's kind of a quick question. Um, something yeah. I was just thinking about this, you um, under your hypothesis. So if uh, economic decline uh, does not spur reactionary thinking, then what leads to these waves of reactionary thinking because, I mean, we, we have to find a way out of this. Sure. Uh, and that's what I've kind of been struggling with as I do some of my own reading as well, is, you know, where do these come from, and then how do we think our way out of it uh, ahead of time? I mean, I think it's worth recognizing, right, that the, the foreign-born share of the U.S. population has, in fact, been steadily rising for years and years and years and years, uh, that, you know, a lot of traditional gender norm ideas have been challenged very aggressively over the past 20 years. And it's not necessarily that opposition to these things has come out of nowhere and that we need to explain where it's come from. It's that actually people on the progressive side have made these changes and not made them for no reason and not made them without support, right? But if you went back to 1996 and you proposed doubling the immigrant population, uh, you know, same-sex marriage, doing meetings where people introduce themselves with their my pronouns, like that kind of stuff. People would look at you like you were crazy, right? Uh, but this has now been been normalized in a lot of places, so there's pushback to it. And I don't 
like agree with that pushback, but it would also be odd to say, well, we could have like vast transformation of our culture and society and nobody would complain about it. Um, and the issue is like how, it's not like how do you break it, it's how do we maintain momentum, uh, particularly when we think about sustainability topics, right? I mean, that's a classic example. It's not like there has been no progress made. Right? There's actually been quite a lot of progress made on, on a number of fronts related to uh, climate change and sustainability. The problem is that the pace of progress has not been adequate to what you know, uh, we think is scientifically necessary. So that's a challenging political task to sort of force a more aggressive pace of change on people when there's like a distribution of attitudes and some people don't like change. Yeah, I'm still kind of like, don't give an example of this reactionary thing of sustainability is when I lived in the Midwest, rolling coal was a thing on uh -huh. drugs. You know, where you inject a lot of diesel fuel in your engine and make black smoke and, you know, you own the Priuses. Uh -huh. So, uh, I just bothers my mind. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how we get out of these trends because even from a short-term thing, you ruin your engine doing something like that long-term, it's just silly. Right, yes, I mean, look, that's a, I think the fact that people did that, it just goes to show that these things are bound up with questions of identity, oh, right? I mean, nobody wants to be see, seen as like the bad guy of history, and that's true for all kinds of people in all kinds of places. If you live in a community that has traditionally been dependent on coal mining, it's like the most understandable thing in the world that not only would you not want to give that up, but you really wouldn't want to hear that like it's bad, that your economic activity is harming people because they're like regular people, right? Like decent people who care about their families and their communities and you know want to have jobs that they're proud of. And if you come and tell them like, no, this is a disaster, like that's a that's a tough sell, um, just naturally. You know, I hear you saying that, talking about people's identity, but in one way, just to kind of condense it down, it's like whiteness. The attachment mm -hmm. to whiteness mm -hmm. is overpowering people's reason, which has happened for a very long time mm -hmm. in this country. But now we're at a critical mass. Because mm -hmm. you're not just dealing with a white black government, mm -hmm. you're dealing with a world that's changing. So how are we going to go forward? It don't deal with this. Um, yes. <laughs> you no, know, I mean, I think uh, I think it was Du Bois, um, you know, wrote about the sort of like the, the psychological wages of, of whiteness, right? That there is a tradition in America of sort of compensating people with a sense of superiority rather than with tangible sort of material uh, things, and that that is part of what is happening here, particularly. Um, I think you see it most obviously around immigration now rather than the sort of traditional black-white racial divide in the United States that um, there is a tangible economic benefit to welcoming immigrants, but there is a psychic benefit to preserving a certain sense of American national identity. You know, how do you cope with that, right? I mean, some of it is challenging in the, in the cultural sphere, right? In like, what am I doing here? I, but you know, you, you try to change people's minds, right? Then in practical politics though, I mean, I do think it's, it's, it's hard to say this, but to an extent you need to accommodate it, you know, and tell people, um, yeah, well, we gotta all speak English, you know, right? If that doesn't have any sort of super concrete harms, and it's like politics is a, is a tough business. And I think you saw, you know, something Barack Obama did throughout his career was bend over backwards to try to make white people more comfortable with him. And that's... Didn't work. Well, <laughs> one of a couple of elections, you know? Um, and then we have Trump. Exactly. Uh, but you know, you need to work on it, not in the electoral arena, but in the arena of society and culture, because that's where you change the landscape of public opinion and you create space for people to you know, behave differently in electoral politics. Yeah, so, you know, if you listen to right-wing media, they talk about their, you know, they're losing and the liberals are taking over, it's a persecution mm -hmm. complex. People find that odd because obviously they control all the levers of power and, you know, whites are still on the 70% of the country or whatever, 60, but 
in your point, the culture, they are losing. If you look at it, uh -huh. again, if you're a white Christian male, your world has been turned upside down in the last 20, 30 years. So we, that's good. I think it's good. I'm glad that we have a more diverse country. I'm glad it's less Christian. But we don't want to rub their face in it, right? That's politically losing. So what's, what's the political strategy for Democrats to have a progressive forward agenda, but not, again, kind of be sore winners? You know? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's about sore winners, you know, or, or, or not, right? Um, I think the unique sort of genius of American politics is that it makes everybody feel like they're losing all the time <laughs> uh, because there's a lot of status quo bias built into the political institutions, so everyone is constantly frustrated. Um, you know, I, I, I think I, I have seen studies on this, right, on different ways that you can talk to people about the multiracial future, and it's like, I mean, you, you sort of have to read it for, for yourself, it gets a little <laughs> tedious, but it's like, there's like an upbeat, optimistic way that makes people feel good, and there's like a, like a you're done with the past way <laughs> that makes people feel upset. Um, you know, and I, I think that's sort of common sense, right? Um, that, you know, you just keep, need to project a certain uh, optimism about the future. But I also think, you know, concretely in politics, right, we've seen a change, right? Starting with Lyndon Johnson and continuing through Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, right? Traditionally, what would happen is Democrats would say, here's a program and it's going to give food to people who are hungry. We're going to give health care to people who are sick. And then Republicans would say, aha, you're helping black people, right? And then Democrats would say, well, we're helping people, we're helping all kinds of people, right? And so it's Republicans would try to increase the salience of racial conflict, and Democrats would try to downplay it. Um, and post Black Lives Matter protests, Democrats have sort of flipped on that and have decided they want to very directly confront uh, the racialized elements of parts of the American system, and that's admirable in some ways, um, but it's only useful if it actually works. Um, and I think, you know, there's something to be said for toning it down a little at times and actually doing the things that help rather than talking constantly. Um, there's people uh, at Demos, they've been like developing a specific race class narrative that's, you know, supposed to like dance around this stuff linguistically. Um, but you know, narrowly, uh, it's a passing political moment. Uh, the demographics are in fact changing. Uh, younger people have much more progressive views on that set of topics. So, you know, that, that should be okay. Um, I, I, I actually worry more about like, the environment uh, where you can't really just say, like, let's chill 15 years and, and see where we are. <laughs> Yeah. You mentioned in one of your slides uh, the notion of the death grip that the Midwest yes. has on the political yes. process. Um, Japan faced a similar situation back in the 70s and 80s with the uh -huh. farmers. Uh -huh. A very small proportion of the country held the country hostage. Was, and I, I can't recall how it was resolved. Uh -huh. but is there any learning there for us for how we might deal with uh, this problem of the a minority exerting tyranny on the majority? Uh, well, you know, it, it's, the problem is deeper than the Electoral College, right? It's built into the structure of the Senate. Um, I don't know exactly what happened in Japan. I mean, the main thing I know that was that Japan does not have a vigorous uh, knife's edge two-party political competition, right? I mean, their politics has been very dominated by liberal Democrats. Then there's a, I, I, I don't want to try to explain it because I'll mess it up, but there's a lot of factional infighting between different yeah. people there. Um, so it's a very different uh, structure of, of partisan politics, and I'm not sure there's that much we can really sort of learn from it. What I think is interesting about America is that the problem, though, is not the overrepresentation of concrete rural interests, right? Like, if the issue here was that rural voters were just demanding a uh, lavish subsidy for broadband internet build-out, then like, fair enough, right? Like, give, 
give them $10 billion, give them $20 billion, right? We've had a kind of nutty uh, farm subsidy system forever. It's not, like, it's not like the best idea in the world, but like we survive uh, subsidized corn. Um, the, the problem has been actually the waning of that kind of material politics, right? In favor of the insistence on a domination of a minority cultural viewpoint. And that's trickier to deal with because you can't, you can't just sort of buy off uh, the people of Kansas if what they want is sweeping change to national immigration policy that will lead to uh, like depopulation of the country, right? I mean, you can give them some money. Um, and I think, you know, when I said that like when you're doing cynical politics, be cynical about it, I think it would be smart to like really like try to offer them like more money um, <laughs> in like a, a naked transactional way uh, because that might work. Um, you just hit on something interesting. Yeah. You commented that we've shifted from material yeah. politics to conceptual or identity yeah. politics. Money doesn't necessarily buy identity. Exactly. No, and I mean, that's, it's challenging, you know, and it's been, particularly when we've had this sort of long span of low interest rates where there hasn't been a tight budget constraint on the government, um, it's, it's difficult. And I think that actually as the labor market has improved, right, that contrary to the hypothesis that this cultural politics would dissipate as people felt less economic pain, I think it's the opposite, right, that um, when you had that big recession in 2008, 2009, you had a temporary return of material politics. But as long as people are going to pay, they want to see their values represented. And it's, a, it's very difficult, um, just conceptually, to compromise your way out of that. I think you kind of hit the great way to test your hypothesis. You said people should move to places like Montana, mm -hmm. or not, Idaho, or South Dakota. Mm -hmm. So big kind of um, high-skilled federal investments and jobs, whether it be in tech or, uh, I don't know, federal government can't do this, but like an Amazon campus, someplace uh -huh. that's gonna bring in workers from outside of the state. Right. And will that state and the people want that economic investment? Right. And will they be like, I sure you could put it in the terms of a Green New Deal, and they'd just be against the Green New Deal in principle, and they don't want any money from that. But, you know, it's uh, the changing of the demographic demographics to, you know, creating these jobs and having people move to these places and stuff. Kind of yeah, and I mean, you've seen it, right? I mean, I think the place where you've really seen that is Texas, uh, which is a very conservative state, but which has a number of large cities, plus a major university town. Uh, under Rick Perry, they very aggressively sought to become uh, a, a, a ton of foreign companies, right? Uh, Asian and European companies needed a place to put a North American headquarters. Um, so those companies tend to want to go somewhere in the middle of the country geographically. Uh, some have a taste for sort of city stuff, and they go to Chicago. Uh, but Perry got a lot of them to come to Dallas. Um, and then you've had a trend toward the energy industry in Houston, and a lot of tech companies sort of zoned out of the Bay Area, went to Austin. And it's been like a great success story. It's something Texas Republicans kind of hold their head high about. Uh, but it has contributed to the political moderation of that state. Texas is so large that even a very substantial influx doesn't quite tip it, right? But if you could, uh, as president, strong arm uh, Jeff Bezos into opening his next office complex, not in Northern Virginia, but in uh, Billings, um, you know, that would uh, be, I think, a smart idea, right? I mean, and again, right, if you're talking energy legislation that you're gonna need to get John Tester to somehow vote for, like there should definitely be a huge research and development effort in Montana. Uh, and I know there are people uh, working on crunching the numbers. What are the most, because you have to consider what are the smallest states, but also how close are they, right? So, so Montana is number one and Alaska is number two in terms of the most mathematically optimal states to try to get people to relocate to. So that's the, if you know any billionaires, <laughs> talk to them or send them my way. Just a follow-up to that question is, uh, it's, uh, do you know any billionaires? Uh, <laughs> oddly enough, I do know a venture capitalist who is heading that way. You, there you go. You meet interesting people on the traveling range of Santa Monica. <laughs> but um, 
to follow up to the question there, uh, there's been states where you've seen a large investment in remote data centers for cloud storage yep. and what have you. Do you know if anybody's done any political science work looking at the difference between those communities and their neighbors? Because that seems to me like a good natural experience. Yeah, that would be a good one to look at. I am. Okay, well, uh, maybe I'll write that paper. Do it. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, you look curious. <laughs> um, so, like, you talked about helping um, struggling regions in accepting ideas that they don't necessarily want. Yeah. But, like, as a way of getting out of this more, like, getting them to accept ideas that they don't want and more just getting people to realize that they do actually want these things. Mm -hmm. Like, should we be talking about, instead of, like, resource extraction is only oil, building these big, manly wind turbines instead? Uh -huh. Like, is it a framing issue? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I think there's obviously something to be said for, you know, um, like green industrial production. Um, I, I also think people should look at uh, selective embrace of, like, like bad economics. Like, like one thing Trump keeps floating is maybe I'll put tariffs on European cars. And if I like went back to my textbook, I could like tell you why that's a bad idea. Uh, but also, like cars are bad, right? Environmentally speaking. Um, so like, if auto industry workers will be happier with tariffs, but also that makes cars more expensive. That's like that's a you don't call that like a Green New Deal. But it's still like a good idea, right? Go, go do that. Um, and I think it's smart to put a lot of protectionist elements in sort of creation of clean power type stuff, right? Like build the wind turbines in America. I will say that the difference, right, between the renewables and the natural resource extraction is that it's uh, much more of a one-time upfront capital cost, and then there's not zero maintenance associated with a wind farm, but it's not an ongoing uh, source of employment, right? You're not gonna have a community where a large number of people work at the wind farm. Um, you might have a factory where they build the components, but it's a, it's a different kind of thing in that regard, I think a little bit inherently. Um, and there's sort of no, there's just no way out of the fact that the labor force is becoming less material and more service-oriented. That's been happening for decades. It's happening in every country. There's nothing you can do about it, really. Um, it, it's it's good to talk about things and you know maybe make fun of people with small hands assembling computer components or something. But you know it, it just it doesn't change the fundamentals <clears throat> all that much, uh, especially because at least as I understand it, it it's best to put these kind of like utility scale renewable projects sort of in the middle of nowhere. Um, I, I'm not an expert in that, but it, it, it doesn't seem as promising as you might like to think it would be. Yeah. So, um, so what do you say to those people that are, uh, want uh, those uh, middle ground, uh, middle of the, uh, country states in the Greek points like tell them like you're gonna have uh, like give them prosperity but yet also get them to convince that climate change is real and it's an issue and it can only get done if we have certain members elected in Congress <laughs> well I mean again I I think the issue, right, from, from what I've seen them say is, it's not actually that difficult to convince people that climate change is real or that it's a problem. The problem is convincing people to make changes in their lives that they don't want to make, right? And I, I just, I, I don't happen to have like any super novel insights into that, um, other than just to say that like, I think you're not gonna fundamentally change human psychology by bringing a dump truck of money to their communities. Uh, people, uh, almost everybody is moderately resistant to change. Some people are more resistant uh, than others, and it's just a just a tough nut to crack, right? It's a, neighbor said something about the uh, the slow boring of hard boards, I think. And, uh, that's, that's politics. There's no, uh, I, I think people in the uh, environmental movement sometimes um, have like wasted decades of their lives trying to think that there's like a magic turn of phrase that's going to make everybody embrace like radical shifts in their lifestyle, and they're just. Isn't. What about 
we're not talking about it in a real way. Because if we were talking about it in a real way, we'd be talking about addressing that, mm -hmm. teaching people about change, mm -hmm. and that we're in a transitional period. <coughs> and to, to talk about the shifting in the environment and climate refugees in a real way in schools mm -hmm. and from the earliest part, but we're not investing in doing that. Mm -hmm. And why? I, it's hard to get things done through schools, if you've ever uh, been involved in the school. Um, you know, what I, what I think is interesting is that... Through education. Yeah, but, but I, I think actually like mass pop culture is a powerful lever for change that can move much more quickly than these other things. And I think you've seen in a, in a lot of different ways, right? I mean, in particular, the very rapid evolution of views on LGBT rights, how powerful sort of a handful of television programs uh, were in that regard. I don't know if any of you guys saw um, uh, the first episode of Watchmen uh, last Sunday, but it's a, it's a new show on HBO. And it's interesting, it's like normalizing the idea of reparations through a like, goofy science fictional conceit about superheroes, right? What we have not seen, I think, is an impact uh, in mass pop culture of sort of climate change thinking, even though the people involved in producing that sort of thing tend to be uh, open to that message, right? I mean, just like very specifically, like Leonardo DiCaprio is well known for like his interest in environmental causes. He also makes a lot of movies, but he doesn't really like make movies that are about how windows are good, uh, which maybe is boring, but you know, you, you, you gotta find a way to sort of get that kind of stuff done, because that is a real tool that does change people's attitudes. I mean, it's a reason conservatives are always complaining, uh, because it's a it's a powerful lever progressives have, uh, but it's, you know, controlled by a handful of corporations who have their own nefarious agendas, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard to just bend it to my will. Alright, well let's give another round here.